Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Welcome to the 2015 Claremont McKenna College Convocation. Will you please join me in silencing your cell phones and then stand and welcome the faculty of Claremont McKenna College.
please remain standing with me on this wonderful and beautiful day. Each day that I wake up, I'm reminded of the wonderful new blessings that are being provided by our young, new young, dedicated, and energetic scholars who are preparing themselves to assume their place as our leaders of tomorrow. Today, we celebrate the start and for the continuation of a wonderful and exciting journey. For all of us, this afternoon represents the beginning of a new and exciting chapter in our lives. In addition, we want to celebrate and honor those who have made it possible for this day to become a reality. Most heavenly creator, today we ask for ears to hear and eyes to see. Let us be open and attuned to the presence of your spirit. May it fill this place and may it fill our hearts and minds with love and acceptance of all of your creation. May your love and care connect us in a bond of mutual love and concern. Please give us the wisdom, the courage, the passion to acquire the knowledge that is needed to learn and effectively serve. We must serve, care, preserve this wonderful and beautiful world that you've given us. Amen. Before I close, I would like to leave you with just a few words from Diedrich Bonhoeffer. This is for our students. If you set out to seek freedom, you must learn before all things mastery over sense and soul, least your wayward desirings, lest your undisciplined disciplined members lead you now this way, now that way. Chaste be your mind and your body and subject to you and obedient, serving solely to seek their appointed goal and objective. None learns the secret of freedom save only by way of control. Do and dare what is right, not swayed by the whim of the moment. Bravely take hold of the real, not dallying now with what might be not in the flight of ideas, but only in action is freedom. Make up your mind and come out into the tempest of living. God commands, God's command is enough and your faith in him to sustain you. Then at last freedom will welcome your spirit amid great and powerful rejoicing. Thank you and have a wonderful year. God bless you all. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Claremont McKenna College convocation for the 2015-2016 academic year. And thank you, Reverend Wood, for your moving invocation. I think everyone could be seated. Um, we're especially grateful also for your contribution of wise leadership this year. Uh, we only hope that you might help us pray successfully for El Nino this winter. Uh, a very special welcome to all the newest members of our community. Uh, our outstanding class of 2019, uh, great transfer students, a uh, talented cohort of new academic leaders, faculty, and staff. Uh, welcome to you all. This is convocation. Convocation is a special moment. And like every moment, from the broad contours of history to the individual threads of our lives, this moment is filled with both hazard and promise. Here's the challenge. The moment of now can either be stuck or moving, pre-baked or pivotal, static or transformational. So how do we summon and inspire our understanding of the moment and what we should do with it? How do we reduce the hazard and realize the fullest promise of it all? As we look out at the world today, we face many challenges. Our state is parched. Violence spar spikes through our communities. Wages stagnate. China falters. 
ISIS conquers, refugees spill and drown in neglect, race and politics polarize, hackers hack and counter hack, security, privacy and transparency collide, debt and drugs drag us down. And yet, we persevere, conserve our resources, speak out against evil, transcend our persistent divisions, innovate to drive value, nourish our communities, heal and emerge more resilient, better. What are the means of rescue and perseverance? Can we step up to lift others? Yes, convocation is a time to assemble to bring in the new school year, celebrate the selfless service of so many and welcome outstanding new members to our community. And at the same time, and perhaps even more importantly, convocation creates a moment to recharge our purpose, to dedicate ourselves to learning, to remind ourselves always that the quality of our minds, our behavior, our shared sense of community are central to our broader purpose and success. So in this moment, whether we are stuck or, or transformative depends on each of us and what we can learn, whether our sense of history can reverse the pattern of our mistakes, whether our insights from econ or psych can avoid the irrational, whether our political science can improve our policies, whether our philosophy or our poetry can possibly overwhelm the bombs and the guns, whether our math can grasp and interpret the black holes in our data, whether our sciences can heal and reshape our interaction with the natural world, and whether our interdisciplines can solve our most complex mixed problem sets. To realize the enormous promise of learning, we raise the critical questions about our assumptions and theories. We bring care to our understanding of others. We muster the courage to confront our fears. We advance imaginative solutions to our most pressing problems. And we grow our leadership capacity by example. So we study hard and debate. We enter the Ath, our temple of wisdom, to challenge our thinking. We compete on the courts and fields to grow our grit. We leverage learning into doing to make positive change. We deepen our sense of personal and social responsibilities. We venture across all partitions and identities to cross-identify and thus grow a deeper unum out of our awesome pluribus. This is how we realize the idea of Claremont McKenna College. This is a college dedicated to grappling with the major questions of our civilization, a college dedicated to mine the power of liberal arts education to get things done, to lift ourselves and the society around us. I'm reminded that Jean Monnet is once known to have said that every new idea is a bad idea until it has an institution. Well, to take Monet's observation one step further, we can also say every institution is a bad institution until it attracts and sustains great people. So seizing the promise of our moment also means setting aside some special time to celebrate our great people, people committed to the values that Dean Uven and President Will Sue will talk about later on this afternoon. People who generate ideas through their scholarship, train the next generation through their dedicated teaching, grow our community through their hard work and selfless service to others, and who lead by example to create and recreate what our CMC community means every day. So I have the honor of recognizing 12 recipients of our community's congratulations and deep appreciation. Their profiles are printed in your program. Unfortunately, Professors Nick Warner and Steve Davis are unable to join us today, but we wish them all the very best as well. Please, as I call each name, I'd like each recipient to stand to be recognized and to remain standing until I recognize each and every one of you 
please hold on your applause until all are standing. First, recognizing the completion of 25 years of service, Professor Sven Arndt, the Charles M. Stone Professor of Money, Credit, and Trade, who recently published a collection of essays on evolving patterns in global trade and finance. And Sven has one of the most retentive memories in our college community. Professor Joe Pissett, recipient of the Distinguished Presidential Award for Merit in 2000, a leading expert in criminal justice, who cherishes how CMC uniquely exposes students to a wide range of controversial issues. Professor John Farrell, whose erudition in literature and history is stunningly wide and deep, even deeper than his devotion to the Boston Red Sox, notwithstanding their fifth place standing in the AL East this year. <laughs> Rafael Huerca, who started as a temporary employee here and served as a building attendant to many CMC residence halls and now works at the Keck Science Center. His professionalism and care on the job has earned the full respect of our community. Cynthia Humes, uh, CMC's Associate Vice President and Chief Technology Officer, Associate Professor of Religious Studies, who works so closely with the late Bart Evans on our groundbreaking Silicon Valley programs and who has been leading our internal collaborations on educational technology and its role in teaching and learning. Robin Aspinall, our Vice President for Business and Administration and Treasurer, who crossed the street from Pomona several years ago and somehow failed to bring some portion of their endowment with her. <laughs> Robin has provided invaluable financial leadership to the transformation of our campus and the growth of our faculty. She stewards our most cherished resources, the people that make it all work. John Ferranda, otherwise known as Mr. CMC, <laughs> class of 79, who returned to CMC in 1985 to join our development office and over the years has served as the warm, welcoming presence for so many generations. John has dedicated nearly his entire life to the CMC community, and it's fitting that his longstanding service will soon be recognized with a plaque on the fountain in Butler Plaza. Teresa Ruiz, who began her CMC career as a building attendant and showed so much initiative and enthusiasm for her job that now she leads a team of 15. She and her team helped make our student residences feel like home, and she too will be recognized with a plaque on the fountain in Butler Plaza for her longstanding service. Third, recognizing the completion of 35 years of service, uh, Teresa Hidalgo, who has worked at Pitzer and many offices within CMC, including treasurer, president, HR, now general counsel, planning, and the board of trustees. Teresa has done outstanding work for the college. She's being recognized for 35 years and with 30 years consecutive service, at CMC, she will also be recognized with a plaque on the fountain in Butler Plaza. Professor Mark Massoud, uh, who joined CMC in January of 1980 and is an icon of warmth and humanity on our campus. He is not only a master teacher in accounting, he treats us all as his family, and we are inspired by his example. Among his many awards are 13 Huntoon Teaching Awards the Presidential Merit Award, and the John P. Ferranda Service Award. Professor Nick Warner, who could not be here today, is also recognized for his master teaching of literature and writing. Nick has won a total of eight Huntoon Awards and the Presidential Award for Merit last year. He served a remarkable two-year term as interim vice president for academic affairs and dean of the faculty. And as I said, we're now recognizing 45 years of service who also could not be here today because he's traveling with our men's soccer team to Texas, is Professor Steve Davis, the Russell K. Pitzer Professor of Philosophy and former CMS head men's soccer coach, an exemplary triple threat of impactful scholarship, dedicated teaching, and service to the community. Okay, well, these folks have st stood long enough, so let's give them all a really outstanding welcome. Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize two recipients of our Exceptional Service Awards. They are Debbie Johnson. Debbie, who began her career at Harvey Mudd College in 1986 before transitioning to CMC in 1988, 
During her time at CMC, Debbie has held many positions in Dean of Students Office, Annual Giving, Alumni and Parent Relations, ITS, and is currently in Public Affairs as the Web Content Manager. She's one of the founding members of the original CMC Web Team and is critically important to our uh, team efforts there. And also DT, Diana Turter Graves, uh, class of 98, uh, who returned to be the CMS women's head volleyball coach and after 12 years of coaching became director of academic planning and has spearheaded many important initiatives including most recently our initiative on personal and social responsibility. We are deeply indebted to her leadership as well. Please join me in congratulating our exceptional <laughs> leadership. Before I turn the program over to our Associate Dean, Ron Riggio, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here and for seizing the promise of this moment together. Last May, our tremendous student commencement speaker, Clancy Tripp, reminded us that CMC is not just a great school or a monolithic identity to which we should all conform. CMC is everyone who contributes to our sense of community and purpose. CMS, CMC is us, Clancy said. CMC is the special group of individuals recognized today. CMC was right. I'm sorry, Clancy was right. CMC is us and CMC is you. It's inspiring for me to learn from you, to learn with you, and to learn and serve for you. I wish you a great start to an exciting year. Thank you very much. Okay, it's my, my great honor and privilege to recognize the faculty awards. Uh, and first up, we've already heard, um, is the Presidential Award for Merit. And that goes to Professor Nicholas Warner, who is on our faculty for 35 years. And two years ago, uh, stepped into the role of interim uh, dean of the faculty and did a terrific job. Uh, Nick Warner's also my daughter's class of 2010's favorite professor. Uh, Nick can't be with us um, because he's in sabbatical and working on a book and another project. So uh, congratulations, Nick. There are two new awards. Uh, the Dean's Distinguished Service Award. Well, it's one award, but there are two recipients. Um, the first recipient is Amy Kind. If Amy will please stand and be recognized. Um, Amy it, has served as Associate Dean of the Faculty. She has, uh, service is really what this award is about, and I think Amy has played every role, uh, every service award. She's been on almost every faculty committee. Um, you know, a, a very strong backbone of the, of the community, so congratulations, Amy. The second recipient is um, Professor Daniel Krauss of Psychology. And uh, Dan, like Amy, has, uh, has been involved in all levels of service, and most recently as chair of the psychology department. And, uh, and Dan also filled in uh, as women's soccer coach. And I can tell you he has a perfect record, um, his one game that he coached. Uh, congratulations to Amy and Dan. The next recipient is uh, the Roy Crocker Award for Merit, and it goes to uh, Roderick Camp. Uh, Professor Camp is in the government department, just completed, I think, as chair of the government department. Uh, again, another pillar of the community, um, incredible amounts of service, and in fact, he's, he's filling in as the standard bearer today uh, for our next recipient. So congratulations, Rod. The next award is the Glen R. Huntoon Award for Superior Teaching, and this goes to Georgie Arshidzi, who's not here today um, because he's at a conference, um, but Georgie just joined us a few years ago and has already been recognized as an outstanding professor, and uh, we expect great things from him in the future. Um, and the interesting thing about this award is it's voted by the students. So the students recognize this uh, young professor. So congratulations to Georgie. And finally, the G. David Huntoon Senior Teaching Award 
uh, goes to Professor Paul Hurley. Um, there's a committee that decides this award, and um, Paul Hurley is a member of the philosophy department, is really one of the true outstanding uh, teachers here, and had the good sense many years ago to move from Pomona College over to, <laughs> to CMC. So congratulations, Paul. <laughs> and to all the faculty recipients. Thank you. And up next is Associate Dean Lee Skinner, who's going to introduce our new faculty members. Yes, it's a pleasure to welcome this group of new faculty who are going to um, more than live up to the expectations set by their outstanding colleagues. So, um, please stand when I call your name, and we'll give we'll hold our applause and give everybody a big round at the end. So, uh, Henri Cole joins us as a professor of literature. He is an award-winning poet who will be offering courses on creative writing in our program. Stacy Doan um, comes to us uh, with a PhD from Cornell. She is an assistant professor of psychology. Her research focuses on emotions and stress. Um, Andrew Finley is an assistant professor of economics with a specialty in accounting. Uh, he has a PhD from the University of Arizona, and his particular area is taxes. He's also a CPA. Bill Lincoln, an assistant professor of economics, holds a PhD from the University of Michigan, and he works on immigration and international trade. Daniel Livesay is an assistant professor of history. He has a PhD also from the University of Michigan. His work uh, is on race, slavery, and family in the Americas. Um, Sharda Umanath, assistant professor of psychology, holds a PhD from Duke and works on memory, which I could all I could certainly use some help with that. Um, Jamel Velji, Assistant Professor of Religious Studies. He was most recently teaching at Haverford College, and he is a specialist in, in Islam. And Angela Vossmeyer is an Assistant Professor of Economics. She has a PhD from UC Irvine, is a Southern California native, and she works on econo econometrics and banking. And uh, Bill Walkenbach also joins us. I don't know if he's here today. It might be a practice because he is our head baseball coach and assistant professor of physical education. So please join me in welcoming these new faculty. And now Rod Kemp will introduce the very most distinguished member of our new faculty cadre. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to have an opportunity to introduce Peter Ruin this afternoon. Peter boasts a distinguished academic career as a professor, scholar, and administrator. He was educated in Europe. He graduated from the University of Geneva with a degree focused on international and development studies. His career led him to three distinguished programs as chair of development studies at Brown, as professor and chair of the Fletcher School at Tufts and as provost at Amherst College. What is most striking about Peter's academic career is its eclectic nature, an ideal reflection of liberal arts training and philosophy and practice. He has spent much of his professional life consulting for many countries and international agencies, ranging from the Netherlands to the World Bank to the European Union. Thus, his scholarship bridges academia to the real world of policy and development themes. However, what I found most impressive about his professional life story is how he conducted much of his research for two notable books, a prize-winning account of violence in Rwanda and a post-violence interpretation of Burundi, researched in part as a Guggenheim Fellow. In the case of the latter book, Professor Uven conducted nearly 400 interviews with ordinary citizens, demonstrating some of the most extensive field research I have encountered. The qualities that it takes to accomplish successfully such a task, superb interpersonal skills, and the ability to listen are the very same abilities one would want to find in a dean of faculty. As a New Haven Review, in a lengthy evaluation of his work argues. His analysis is an example of policy writing at its best. 
and that in his plea in favor of defining all development and all development aid in more holistic and political terms at both the intellectual and operational level, <clears throat> he sprints far beyond the way the debate is usually framed in popular discourse to a series of conclusions that are as smart as they are practical. The faculty, staff, and board of trustees identified similar qualities in his initial visit to our campus. And so with those expectations, we anticipate his insightful remarks today on civil war and deanship, parallels and insights. Good afternoon, and thank you for those kind words, Rod. In many ways, he's already given away half of my talk. So I'm going to give you the other half, which now should only last about an hour or two. Um, so as Rod said, I spent about 20 years of my life working as both a practitioner and a scholar in Africa. I started working on matters of socioeconomic development, but over the years moved into questions of conflict and conflict prevention and peace settlements, as well as rights, governance, and democracy. And afterwards, I moved into academic administration. And people often asked me, and they still ask me today, whether there is anything that has prepared me in my prior work for my current job assuming, frankly, that there is no, no such thing. And I always tell them, oh yeah, absolutely, I see many links, and I wanna tell you what those links are. So obviously, before we go there, I'm not remotely suggesting that the civil wars and the situations of extreme poverty that I've seen in my life in any way resemble our life. That would be ridiculous. Um, <laughs> in this place here, in this room here, we, we are basically a, a collection of the world's global 1% or so with the very best jobs that we could humanly imagine, assuming being a student is a job. Um, it is a great job, by the way. <laughs> Just lowly paid. Um, <laughs> but that holds for us faculty, too. So, um, so we, we have phenomenal jobs. We have a degree of freedom of expression and of being ourselves and following our own path that is absolutely unparalleled. We live in a world where we can expect security and safety around us that is without parallel. So nothing in how we function or live here is indeed in any way resembling the worlds that I have spent much of my life in, in Burundi or Rwanda or Chad or Niger and so many other countries. So clearly, I'm not saying that. I'm actually counting my blessings every day. What I am talking about, however, is the fact that it seems to me, looking back at my career, that the causes and the deeper drivers of these civil wars and situations of extreme deprivation that I worked in are actually often amazingly similar to what can and often does go wrong in colleges and universities. Uh, and as a result, the sort of things I was doing in Africa in terms of trying to think about and work with people on solutions to these causes and crises, in a fundamental way resembles the things I'm doing here in my daily life as well. And that's what I want to talk about. So I'll give you maybe five sort of signposts that I used back in my older days in the work in Africa and that I still use today to help me understand situations or identify problems. So the first one is a sense of community, or very often, the lack thereof. So one of the key factors in the civil wars that I've worked in, that I've encountered, is essentially the fundamental absence of a sense of community. There are significant groups of people in those places that essentially believe that some category of others do not belong in their country, in their city, in their neighborhood, in their family, whatever it be. And by the way, one of the amazing things in life is that this process of defining people as others, as outsiders, has nothing whatsoever to do with any necessarily objective fact of being actually from the outside. Uh, Burundi and Rwanda, which are places I know uh, best and have written books about, are both places where the people concerned have lived literally since hundreds and hundreds, if not a thousand years, side by side. They don't even live in different regions. They live actually in the same villages interspersed. And yet, it obviously has not stopped 
them from defining each other in fundamentally different ways. Um, but by the way, one can go on any continent and find similar situations. Um, and especially when that process of defining people as others then gets associated with assigning particular traits to them, um, that they're unreliable or that they're short-sighted or that they're lazy or that they're only into it for themselves uh, or that they're unprincipled or whatever, you do easily lay the groundwork for m significant conflict. Um, and again, this happens in those places far away, but it happens much nearer to home as well. I think in every university I've been part of, for example, I've seen departments, and unfortunately I've even been part of such departments, um, that have been profoundly divided between people, for example, who used quantitative and qualitative methods. By the way, for the rest, they really look alike. All they have is different methodologies, and yet they could basically not speak to each other anymore for years and years and fundamentally define the other as outside of the bounds of their community. This can have happened between uh, positivist scholars and critical theory scholars or conservative and progressive scholars. It happens among students, between athletes and non-athletes in places I've worked at. It can actually happen amazingly easily. Um, so much of my job here, as in Africa, is to find ways to include again, to rehumanize instead of dehumanize, and to rebuild community where it broke down. And as I look at your lives here and in the future, I bet you that many of the most important challenges you are going to face, exactly the same ones. Number two, legitimate institutions. If there's one thing indeed that I've absolutely learned in life, it's how amazingly fragile institutions actually are. So institutions we typically defining as having formal elements, right? Um, rules, officers and offices, right? Places, buildings, laws, whatever. And then they also have informal elements, expectations, norms, um, habits. Yeah? And the two of them sustain and create institutions. Um, both of these, by the way, often take a long time to emerge. Uh, and as an aside, I, I think looking back, one of the saddest things about the human condition is how long it takes to create a good institution and how stunningly easy it can often be to revert it. Uh, just one example that came to mind is the other day is, is, say, democracy in Tunisia, right? It took tens of thousands, if not millions of people, uh, great courage and months and years of fighting to establish it. And it takes a couple of assholes with bombs to fundamentally threaten it. Right? Building an institution is so much harder than undermining one. And this is constantly the case. It holds here in our own campus just as much. And as an aside, it's not so much the formal parts of institutions that matter. It's actually the informal ones. It's what's in our minds and in our hearts it actually really matter. We can keep all the buildings, we can keep all the books, and we can keep all the, the bank accounts, but if people stop believing in something, then the real de facto institution will soon start diverging significantly from the uh, formal de jure institution. And this holds for colleges as much as for, institution, uh, for countries or communities far away. Um, you know what? Let's skip this paragraph. Next one. <laughs> it was a good one, you know, but <laughs> we, we can't do everything in life. That's rule number six, which I'm not going to talk about, um, but which is very important for you, by the way. But leave that aside. Number three that I wanted to talk about is predictability. So I was telling you how, how fragile institutions can be, including the ones we take for granted and including the one we are in. Um, related to this, I think one of the key ways that actually institutions become fragile, become emptied or eroded, is uh, through unpredictability or a lack of predictability. And again, this holds for colleges in the United States as much as it holds for countries in Africa or elsewhere. I remember my first class in law school uh, half a century ago or so. Um, and my first class, literally, the professor walked in and he said, what is the law about? And um, of course, nobody spoke because we didn't want to be wrong. But um, eventually, he told us the law is not about justice, but about predictability. And I was extremely deeply disappointed. 
<laughs> I surely had not gone to college to become a fighter for predictability. <laughs> I saw myself as a fighter for justice. So I decided then and there not to become a lawyer, and I did stick to that. <laughs> later on, I realized my professor was right. Um, many years later, after my disappointing start to law school, I attended a talk here in the United States where we had, what's his face again, uh, Rolf Meyer came to speak. Rolf Meyer was the um, national party negotiator for the end of um, apartheid in South Africa. Now, for many of you of, of us who are older distinctly remember apartheid, but for years he, a white man who had been previously the minister of defense and hence was eminently an insider and a representative of the regime, and Cyril Ramaphosa, who was a member of the ANC and a communist and black, negotiated. For years, they negotiated the transition. Two people who could not be more unlike. And somebody asked him, how did you two manage to actually continue going when everything was pushing against you, when, when you couldn't talk to each other anymore? And he said, oh yeah, these, these instances occurred frequently that they broke down. They just could not find a way to continue talking anymore. He said, but we had agreed to go to the court at that time and let the court settle it. And I remember thinking, that's amazing. Here you have two guys with vastly opposed interests in a system where both of them do not like the law as it is, and yet both of them trusted that law enough that they knew it would be implemented. It was predictable. It might have been bad law, but it was predictable law. And I think that made me realize something that's a strong statement. I was talking about it with President uh, Hiram Shodosh when I was walking in here as well. I have come to believe in many ways that having bad law that's implemented is better than good law that's not implemented. Because if you have bad law that's implemented, you have something to hold on to, something to predict, and something you can try to change. If you have good law that's not implemented, you have arbitrariness you have unpredictability. And unpredictability is the enemy of any social change or any institution. And so over the years, I have actually come to believe in a way that runs very much counter to my younger self that my professor A was right. I hope this sometimes happens to you too. And, <laughs> and I hope it doesn't take you 40 years to figure it out <laughs> as it did for me. But also that as a manager of an organization, it actually may at times be more important to seek for maximum predictability rather than maximum justice. I find that still hard, by the way, but I'm working on it. Um, number four, relishing difference. Um, so this fourth signpost that guides me, both when I worked in Africa and now when I work here, is about the difficulty, the beauty, and the absolute necessity of being able to work across differences. I've learned in all these years that the key to any sustainable type of change that you would like to achieve is to include the difficult people, the negative forces, the enemies, the ones you can't stand and the ones who can't stand you, the ones with whom you share nothing. You see, it's very easy to work together with the people you agree with people who share your background, people who look like you, who think like you. It's still work, but it's easy work. But the capability to do it with those who are not like that, that's where true leadership emerges. And that's also where sustainable change becomes created. Now pay attention. In part, this is not a matter of you. It's a, it's a matter of institutions and processes. There should be in a society or in a community like this, institutionalized, legitimate, and predictable ways in which people of different opinions can feel sure that their opinions and their needs and their values will be taken seriously into account. So part of it is an institutional matter. But part of it is also a matter of personal behavior, attitudes, and skills. It's about the capacity of each of us to listen carefully, to suspend judgment, to see things from the perspective of others, to accept our own experience as just that, our own, not those of the rest of the world. And college, by the way, in that respect, is an amazing place to learn more about that. I think for many of you, for many of us too, this is a place where you're in an environment where there are more people unlike yourself than you've ever been in before. And so this is a great moment to actually reach out and learn more about how to develop that skills set and how to become a richer person. 
learn to listen and not just to debate. Learn to engage in difficult conversations and not just to politely avoid them. Um, learn to collaborate and not just to win. Learn to compromise. A vastly underrated value today. My final one is actually probably the most important signpost in my life, which I try to teach my students in my classes as well, albeit not so directly and briefly as I'm doing it here. And that's one is called respect. So it, I believe it's in many ways the immediate corollary of almost everything I've spoken about so far here. Sense of community, uh, the relishing of difference, the legitimacy of institutions. A good society, whether it's a country, again, or an institution like this, which is a society as well. A good society is a society whose institutions and practices do not humiliate its members. This holds for all of us. I believe having lived in many situations of great conflict that the most fundamental reason why these things happen is offenses to people's sense of self-respect and dignity. There is nothing more important in life than that, I believe, that drives us as individuals or as societies. It's odd because I come from development and in that world, and I think in our society at large, we tend to believe nearly the opposite. We are all pretty much Maslowians. You remember you must have had it in high school too, you too, um, just longer ago. Um, <laughs> this hierarchy, this triangle of uh, needs, right? Uh, with at the bottom physiological needs, um, food, water, shelter, right? and all the way up and on top in a very, very small, tiny little uh, triangle at the top is, I think, self-actualization. And then just below that is belonging and dignity and love. Does that match life? And I'm not saying that food and uh, water and shelter are not important. Without those Basically, there is not much of an institution to be made in the first place, because we are all gone. But at the end of the day, what people live for and strive for, what drives them, what creates or destroys communities, it's not that stuff. It's that sense of belonging, of being loved, of being respected. It's the fundamental driver of life, I believe, and it's the fundamental cause of conflict in this world. And again, by the way, like with the previous one, respect can be built in the processes and the procedures and the laws and the regulations of an institution, and it should be. But it's also a matter of how each of us chooses to behave on an individual level. Um, and again, here too, learning how to do that, not just in theory, but how to actually convey respect to everyone, not just, again, those who you agree with or those who are like you or those who you like, but also those who you do not like, or those who are there to serve you, is one of the very most crucial things, I believe, whether it is actually to solve civil wars or to manage an institution of higher learning in the United States. I could go on for a long time about those things, but I will spare you that. All I wanted to say is these are five of the things that have influenced my life as a practitioner beforehand and as a practitioner in a vastly different world here right today. I hope that having shared them with you will provide you some uh, nourishment, some intellectual nourishment as well. I wish you all a great year of learning, of being challenged, and of enjoying yourself. Thank you very much. Hi, it's time for some singing. <laughs> um, if you haven't done this before, you'll notice in your program we've got some song lyrics. And I know that over here there are a lot of people who've sung this song before. And so I encourage them to sing really loudly for the rest of the room. Um, OK, if you notice line five in your lyrics, there's a Latin bit. Let's just practice that before we launch in here. Um, OK, so repeat after me. Crescit, cum comercio, kiwitas. Well, let's do the whole line at once. Crescit, cum comercio, kiwitas. OK, that's all you need to do. Um, this is a tuning fork. OK. 
We're the sons and the daughters of Claremont McKenna and proud of our famed alma mater. With friends of our youth seeking wisdom, seeking truth, we will lead on from Claremont McKenna. We have Crescent, Kumkomer, Kio, Kiwi Toss as our motto at Claremont McKenna. We always will be part of dear old CMC, ever loyal to Claremont McKenna. Bravo. Please be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Will Su. I am the ASMC president, and it is an honor to speak today at our 69th convocation. Before I get started, I just want to thank everyone for being here today, because I know the real reason you're bearing with me is to get those awesome free t-shirts at the end of convocation. Right. I'm going to share some senior wisdom. You don't even need to come to this. Just make sure you pass by McKenna Auditorium at 2 p.m. But don't tell the deans I said that, okay? Anyway, I wanna welcome the class of 2019, especially our returning students, faculty, and staff who work so diligently to make CMC a great institution. It's hard to believe that I am beginning my final year at CMC, but nevertheless, as a senior, there's still much to learn, much to experience, and much to share. A year ago, we started on the Mellon Roundtables discussing key elements of the student experience like creativity, empathy, and courage. Today, I want to focus on courage. In the spring, a group of students, faculty, trustees, and college administrators met to answer a question. How does one teach courage? After two hours of brainstorming and deliberation, we still didn't have a good answer. Um, we barely walked away with a definition, and we had to use a lot of examples to even define courage. We asked ourselves, does standing up to your boss take courage? Does streaking across a college campus take courage? What about making the decision to study abroad? What about asking out that cute classmate of yours? We settled for a nice medium between recklessness and calculated risks. And while I'm still not certain on how to teach courage, I am certain our courage is tested every day. So why do we need courage today? I think our institution is in the midst of great change that requires us to go above and beyond. Themes of personal and social responsibility and concepts of change making have saturated our conversations for far too long. And the next big step is to take action. It is time to take responsibility. It is time to take the future of our institution into our own hands. Our liberal arts education prides itself on developing critical thinking. It's time to put the liberal arts in action and act with courage. My challenge this year to the CMC community is to be more courageous. I challenge you to exit the comfort zone and seek greatness in discomfort. Choose courses and work, not for the ease, but for the rigor and to satisfy your curiosities. Intervene when you sense danger because it's on us to prevent sexual assault. Open your hearts to your peers, because you are not alone in facing uncertainty and fearing vulnerability. Stand up to irresponsible behavior that threatens the very fiber that holds our community together. Brave the tendency to ignore difficult conversations and speak up on issues of race and identity. And this challenge doesn't just stop with students. To our esteemed faculty, your presence can change a life. Mentorships aren't assigned, but neither are they accidents. Student engagement is not a one-way road, and I challenge you to have the courage to meet us halfway. You have the power to save us from ourselves. You have the experience to push us to our full potential through clubs, research, and more. You have the wisdom to inspire passion that we otherwise would never have found in ourselves. I remember the line that convinced me to come to CMC. I was told, you will be a name and not a number. Dear professor, engage us and don't let me become a number. And lastly, to our college administrators, we need your trust. We own that as students, we don't always make the right choices, but we are constantly learning. I challenge you to have the courage to draw us into the conversation because our voices need to be heard. 
over-communicate because our past failures to do so have cost us too much. The advancement of our institution goes hand in hand with students working alongside our college administration. Take a leap of faith in that we as students can and will hold ourselves accountable when you empower us. In a time when our nation demanded courage, FDR once said, it is common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, try something. So instead of focusing on how to teach courage, let's strive to live with courage every day. If we all do our part, what the CMC family can accomplish will be unimaginable. I'd like to invite you all to join us after convocation at our reception to welcome our new Dean of Faculty, Dean Uben, from 2 to 3 p.m. in the Athenaeum. Have a great year, everyone. Thank you very much. Please stand and remain at your seats until the faculty has recessed. Thank you.